coming up on Bridges. So we understand that what really matters to God is that we obey the truth and that we have a persistent, unrelentant kind of faith. And then that we do what we can and we forget worrying about what everybody else is doing and look at what God is speaking to us. And to understand that the service that we provide to our children, the service that we provide to our families, the service that we provide in our churches and our communities matters to God. It's not always just those big things. That's not it. That's the world system. Today on Bridges, Monica Speaks. Hi, I'm Monica Schmelter, and I want to welcome you to the studio audience edition of Monica Speaks. Today, we're going to open up the Word of God and really talk about what really matters to God. And for all of us, I think if we're honest, we want to live a life that's about what matters to God. Uh, sometimes we sort of just kind of fly blind, so to speak. We imagine that this is what would please God or that's what would please God. Or if you talk to people, they'll say, well, you know, this is what I believe about God. Well, we can all believe, I guess, whatever we want to believe. What, what's important is to know what does he say to us? Because a lot of us walk around with this idea that in order to really be important to the kingdom of God or to contribute something that's significant or lasting, that we sort of need to have a big name. That's kind of what's pushed out there, you know, or that we need to be in full-time ministry. And full-time ministry is right if that's what you're called by God to do. But whether you work a full-time career in some mainstream vocation or not, that has nothing to do with the kind of impact that we can make in the kingdom of God. God looks at things differently than we do, and he measures things differently than we do. If you look even at the story of the widow's might, it's clear to me that God counts differently than we do. Because, you know, it says that the people in the treasury, you know, were counting all that money as it was being contributed and, and that she gave more than everybody gave. Well, how could the widow that gave two mites, a very small amount, be more than anybody else? She gave all she had. Jesus saw the sacrifice. He saw the obedience, and that's what really mattered to him. It wasn't the amount. You see, that's what ranks up on the world system. And everybody goes cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. But God's not measuring us by the world's yardstick. He's looking at our hearts. He's looking at our lives. You all, if we measure ourselves by the world system, we are all in trouble. Because we're not tall enough or we're too short or we weigh too much or not enough. We don't speak right. We're narrow-minded. We're too light. We're too dark. We're too old. We're too young. No, do you ever notice how that is? You know, I remember when I was young, people told me I'm too young. Now I get older. Now I'm too old. I don't know. <laughs> you want to say, what do you want from me anyway? <laughs> but we're talking today about what really matters to God. And I want us to look at John and chapter 8 for just a moment. We're going to pick up in the story of the woman that's caught in adultery. And uh, it says in John 8, starting in verse 9, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, when you look at this whole story, Obviously, for the woman that was caught in adultery, this is not the best day of her life. I mean, because if you're caught in the act of adultery and you're drug out to the town square, you know, you didn't quite get ready for the event. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. You're not, you know, you talk about being caught unprepared. Right. And not only are you caught unprepared, you're caught unprepared by people who have it out for you. And people who are looking to trip Jesus up, the important people of the day. You know how that is in this world system? You know, those important key people, and they've got something to say about everybody. And so they, they like want this woman to be stoned. They want her to have the full penalty of the law. 
We don't know where Mr. Wonderful is and why he's not there and why he wouldn't run out there with her. Do you know what I'm saying? And protect her and say, you know, I'm guilty too. Blame me. No, Mr. Wonderful, I don't know. He, you know, ran away. But Jesus says, you know, we're your, we're your accusers. And she says, well, I don't have any. And he says these words, go and sin no more. What really matters to God is that we obey the truth. You know, what's phenomenal about this story, obviously that he loved a woman caught in the act of adultery. Obviously that Jesus loves people enough that he'll stand up to religious persecution. He doesn't back down to anybody. When the word says he is our advocate, he is our advocate. Don't think for one second he backs down to the devil when the devil goes up before him and accuses us because the word says he's the accuser of the brethren. So when the devil goes before God and he says, well, so-and-so did and so-and-so did and she did and she did, Jesus does not say, oh, you're absolutely right. He advocates for us just like he did for this woman. He doesn't back down to anybody. He doesn't care what kind of power, what kind of prestige, what, what kind of title. You're a Pharisee, a Sadducee, a priest, a pastor. Mm. He doesn't care. He advocates for us. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. So he stands up for this lady, but when he says, oh, yeah, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more, she obeys the truth. Because you all, it's not enough just to know the truth not just enough to know intellectually or even a little bit, you know, emotionally that he died for our sins and that the power of sin doesn't have dominion over us anymore. It's enough. What matters to God is do we obey the truth? The reason that she was able to go and witness to others and walk into some of the same difficult circumstances that she had probably been in before, because you know, when you're the woman that commits adultery, like in, back then, not now, People probably remember that. I know, you know, today, you know what I'm saying? It's not, right. it's more accepted these days. But in this day, it was a great big deal. So she goes back to some of these same people and she witnesses of the goodness of God. And she brings people to Christ. How is she able to do that? She's doing that because she obeys the truth. She accepted what he said, that he did not condemn her. She took the power of his word and she acted on us, acted on it. And you see, that is the challenge and the objective and the key for every one of us is to obey the truth. What matters, really matters to God is not that we can preach a sermon. It's not that we can witness to somebody in exactly the right order. It's not that we can pray the most beautiful prayers or sing the most beautiful songs or wear the best outfits or have people think that we're the most educated or the richest or the most popular or the best or any of those things in the world. It's that we obey the truth. Because we really mean it when we obey the truth. I mean, she took him exactly at his word. He said, I don't condemn you go and sin no more. And she took those words and she walked right on them. And that's what we need to do. When he says to us, whom the son is set free is free indeed, we need to walk in that freedom and not get entangled up with the sin and the cares and the stuff of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth and riches. And you guys, you know, just all the stuff that weighs heavy on us the responsibilities, the obligations, the bills that are coming up next week, the car that might need a repair, and the transmission that's out, the husband that's cranky, the cat that keeps meowing, you know. <laughs> the phone that won't stop ringing. Have you ever noticed? Like when you just need peace and quiet, that's when everybody calls? I think no one has called me in two days. <laughs> and now today, 14 people wanna talk. <laughs> and they don't wanna get off the phone. It's like, I gotta go. But what matters to him, what really matters to God is that we obey the truth. And some people will be like, well, you know, I don't know where to start. Start where you are. Obey what you know. God won't give you the next step until you obey what you know. Like if I gave you directions to come to my house and you call me and you say that you're on I-24 and you're not there yet, I'm not gonna continue to give you the next street because you're not there yet. 
is not going to do you any good. I need to get you off the exit that comes to our house. And then I can tell you, we'll turn right or turn left and look for this landmark. But I got to get you off of I-24. And you know, sometimes when we're seeking God for direction, we're seeking God to fulfill his purpose, we want to know the whole picture. And he's like, hey, would you just obey the truth that you know right now, this moment, and would you trust the rest to me? That's why it's called a relationship. That's why we're not Holy Ghost robots. He doesn't give us all the instructions and every day we just get up and repeat it. Couldn't you just see that life the way that we are as people? We get out our little Holy Ghost checklist, check, check, did this, did this. God, I'm doing good. I'm doing so good. Look at me. I did my list. Hallelujah. We go to life group at church. I did my list. And he's like, I'm not looking for you to do the list. I'm looking for you to obey the truth. What really matters to God, obey the truth. If you don't know the whole picture, obey what you know. Open up the word, obey what you know, and then he'll show you more. Because he tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You don't ever get there. It's a, it's a journey. <laughs> and none of us ever arrive. I've served God for more than 35 years. I certainly don't know everything. I know more, hopefully, than I did when I gave my heart to Christ at 13. We would hope so. We would hope that I've grown a little. But there's lots more to know, lots more roads to travel. So what really matters to God is that we obey the truth. And then the next thing that really matters to God, or one of the next things, is that we have persistent faith. You all know that in our human nature, depending on how we're wired and how we've been brought up, some people really, when they experience obstacles, or as one Arkansas preacher that I know calls them, obstacles. <laughs> He's a really good preacher, but he said the obstacles, and it was hard for me not to laugh. Those obstacles will get you every time. Sometimes we get out there in our effort and our real heart's desire to obey the truth and the obstacle seems so much bigger than what we thought and we back down like you know I can't really do that we get frustrated y'all ever been there disappointed like you know God maybe you really didn't want me to do that after all you know everything's coming against me I don't I don't understand this you all that is something that happens to every one of us on planet Earth. It's called a test of faith. And for all of us, our faith gets tested. And it's not always pleasant. When you look at Jesus even being led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, you know, and you look at his 40-day fast and the work that he did, we look at him as Jesus, the supernatural, you know, just able to walk on the water and do all things. And he did all those things. He did. But you read that about him fasting. It says that he got tired and he got hungry. So if we're thinking that this journey of what really matters to God means that we're not going to get tired, <laughs> We're not going to get hungry and we're not going to get disappointed and it's not going to be challenging. Then your expectations or our expectations are so unrealistic. We are going to crash and burn every time. Nobody has ever done anything great. And when I say great, I don't just mean write books or do TV or radio or like that stuff. You know, it's a great thing to raise a child. And it's not for cowards. I'm going to tell you something, to raise a child in the ways of the Lord will take everything you've got and a little bit more. It means being able to say no when you mean no. It means being able to take being the meanest mommy in the whole world sometimes. It means being able to listen to, I am the only one who's not being allowed to do blah, blah, blah. And you do it because you love them. And because you love the Lord, because the Lord says that when you love someone, you discipline them. So this journey requires persistent faith. Look with me at Luke 8 and verse 43. It says there a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. And she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately the bleeding stopped. No doubt 
This is a supernatural, miraculous story, and we should all jump, scream, and shout at least 15 times. But think about the 12 years this lady suffered chronically sick. And you all, it's not just a cough or a sneeze. She's bleeding. She's considered unclean. Can you imagine like being a social outcast for 12 long years, day after day, calendar year after calendar year, birthday after birthday, holiday after holiday, how that would just wear on you? And I can only imagine since she's sick and since she's bleeding, physically she's weak too. Now, we've all had an experience or two with being ill. You know what it's like when we just get in that weakened state? Everything gets hard to take. We don't look as good. We look in the mirror and think, oh, it's bad, you know? <laughs> it's so bad. Because, you know, we can't clean up as well. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just <laughs> a few times I look in the mirror and I scare myself. It's like, ooh, <laughs> you really have been under the weather. But I think about this lady and her life and what it had to be like for her practically not to be allowed in public so does she send other people to the store? I mean, does somebody stop by and help her? How does she do the daily functions of life and care for herself? We know that she looks for cures, so she's got that heart to be healthy. Do you know, like, if you go to doctor after doctor after doctor and everybody says no go, no cure, can't do anything, how disappointing that would be? And then to add insult to injury, not only do you hear no hope, no cure, nothing we can do, would you please pay me the $35 copay? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the right was then, but you know what I'm saying. We still got to pay because <laughs> it's a medical practice. <laughs> and they're practicing on us, <laughs> practicing this and practicing that, trying to come up with something that will work. And we appreciate that. You know, I respect it, the process. But, you know, sometimes I go to the doctor and I go again. They keep practicing. They've got to keep changing it up. You know what I'm yeah. saying? This lady heard that over and over and over again. As I was thinking about last night, 12 years, like how long 12 years is. So I thought about, okay, 12 years ago in my life, I was 40. And I remember that the team that worked at WHTN at the time gave me a 40th birthday party. I remember what I wore to the party. They put together a little video, you know, the Brady Bunch song and the little show where they've got all the little videos of Marsha and Cindy, the little pictures. So the team did that and they put everybody's picture in one little thing. And we had one guy who worked here at the time, Mark, who never wanted his face on camera. So he turned around <laughs> so that the back of his head was in his picture. And they wrote lyrics to the little Brady Bunch song. And it was just really cute. And I still have the little VHS tape today. <laughs> But I think about 12 years, do you know, I can remember that, but do you know it's like so long ago I don't remember it? Do you know what I mean? Like it seems so long ago and I think this lady was sick for that long. And yet she had that persistent faith that when it came to Jesus, she wasn't going to give up. And I submit to you today that what really matters to God is that we have persistent faith. Your circumstances and situation may seem above and beyond challenging to you. It may be year after year of sickness, financial difficulty, relational dis difficulty, vocational lapses. There are things in this life that sometimes, you guys, they go on for years. And I know that that doesn't sound encouraging to you, but what I'm trying to say is despite all that, we can have persistent faith. Maybe you're believing for loved ones or relatives. Perhaps you're believing for more patience to be a, a more godly parent, to be a more mature Christian. Maybe a certain sin or a certain behavior has sifted you time and time again and you think that you can't ever get to the other side. With persistent faith, we can get to the other side. 
it might take several days and several nights and it might take fasting and it might take prayer and it might take reciting the word to the top of your lungs. And let me tell you something, when I'm desperate, I don't care who hears me and what they think. There are times that I have prayed in my house to the top of my lungs and you know what, let everybody hear it and everybody think I'm weird. When I have someone that I know that needs to be saved, when I'm struggling with something, when it's my marriage that's on the line, you better believe I'm gonna cry out with everything I've got and you can tell me to shut up, but I'm not. Because it's persistent faith. And we have to come to that place and understand that's what really matters to God. Because we live in a time that tells us every single day, everything should be easy. Everything should be convenient. You should place your order at the drive-through and I promise those chicken McNuggets and fries better be there in two seconds or less. Do you know what I'm saying? Because if they're not, we just don't know what to do. If we don't get those chicken McNuggets, I mean, we could perish. We're hungry, that's why we're there. That's why it's called fast food. Oh, I can't believe it's taking so long. You know how we are, but I'm just saying. Persistent faith. Don't be afraid to be persistent. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't let your own flesh talk you out of it. Don't let your own disappointment talk you out of it. The lady with the issue of blood didn't. And there are some things that they just matter that much. There are some things that we just hold on to by faith, knowing that God is able. And listen, even if everybody else thought this lady was crazy, and I'm, I'm assuming they did, wouldn't you? You know, she's like the sick neighbor lady that just acts weird all the time. So maybe everybody thinks we're weird. Ah, you've been hoping for that for so long. You've been believing for your marriage for so long. You've been believing for a better job for so long. Eh, 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 eh. Persistent faith. It mattered to Jesus that this lady hung on. It mattered to Jesus that she walked out in a public setting where she wasn't supposed to be. It mattered to Jesus that she reached for the hem of his robe. He knows when we've touched him. When we've come to him in prayer and we've reached out with everything that we have, don't let the devil make you think for one second God doesn't hear. Don't, don't let your flesh think, oh, nothing's changing. When you pray, things change. I know we don't always, things don't always happen exactly the way we pray. You know what? They happen better. The older I get, the more convinced I get that even when I don't know what God is doing, he's doing something way better. I get to the other side and I'm like, oh my gosh, God, you had this in mind for me. This is so amazing. So persistent faith. And then it's important that we do what we can. Let me read from Mark 14, starting in verse 3. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. One of the things that stand out to me about this story is that Jesus said she has done what she could. So what really matters to God is that we do what we can. We can all talk about all the things that we would do if we had a bazillion dollars, what we would do if we didn't have to work a full-time job. <laughs> But you know, if you got to work a full-time job, you work a full-time job. And if you don't have a bazillion dollars like I don't, I can only do what I can. But she's commemorated because she did what she could. One of the things that we got to understand and what really matters to God is that he counts differently than we do. He measures differently than we do. So when we look at all the big name people and all the things that they do, he's not measuring us that way. I promise that we're not going to stand up there before him and say, you sold 10 million books, so you're better than blah, blah. This lady, we are still celebrating her. I call her a Jane Doe of the Bible. 
the woman with the alabaster box who we really don't know all that much about, but she did what she could. And Jesus commemorated that. And he said, wherever the good news is preached, we're going to remember what she's done. You all, in some of the seemingly insignificant places in which we serve, in which we live, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, we do what we can and we understand that that's what really matters to God. He doesn't judge us or hold us accountable for what we don't have. When I see him, he's not going to ask me about $5 million because I've never had $5 million. I've never even had a million. And I'm not complaining. It's all good. I'm just saying he's not going to hold me accountable for what he didn't entrust me with. We all have different gifts. We have different talents. We have different amounts of intelligence. We have different personalities. But he's got us all where he needs us to be. And what do we do? We do what we can we don't look at that person over there or that situation over there. We do what we can. So we understand that what really matters to God is that we obey the truth and that we have a persistent, unrelentant kind of faith. And then that we do what we can and we forget worrying about what everybody else is doing and look at what God is speaking to us. And to understand that the service that we provide to our children, the service that we provide to our families, the service that we provide in our churches and our communities matters to God. It's not always just those big things. That's not it. That's the world system. And if we go there, we'll always come up short because the world just kind of devours everybody and spits everybody out. You can be in one minute and out the next minute. I don't really, I feel sorry for some of those stars in the way that they get treated. They're like the best things since sliced bread and then everybody doesn't like them. And I don't really understand what happened. And they probably don't either. Thank God he's not like that. <laughs> Thank God he's not like that. And what really matters to God is that we obey the truth that we walk in persistent faith, that we do what we can and understand that's all that God asks of us. That's all that he requires. We are completely out of time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for coming. We've got to go, but we say goodbye and God bless you. If you would like to purchase a copy of today's show for $15, you can send a check to the address on your screen or call us at 615-754-0039. Be sure to mention the program number on the screen. We can give our love to our Savior extravagantly, regardless of what we are going through. There is not anything that can stop us if we are willing from loving him extravagantly and yielding ourselves to him and that trusting that his will is better than our will. To schedule Monica to speak at your next event, contact her at monicaspeaks.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash monicaspeakstv today. Thanks for joining us today on Bridges.